Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, our latest European Parliamentary Research Service Roundtable. Some of you will recall that um, almost exactly three months ago, we did a similar panel before the US presidential and congressional elections to try to discern the outlook for that decisive and historic contest. And uh, uh, it certainly proved to be one of the most interesting election outcomes and subsequent post-election periods that I think anybody's ever seen in their lifetime, certainly in any democratic culture. And we're delighted now today to have from Washington DC four very distinguished uh, think tankers and academics who are going to talk about the way they see the unfolding political scene in the United States. And the focus for this will be Biden's first 100 days. What are think tanks expecting from that process? I'll very briefly introduce our four distinguished panelists. Fran Burwell, who is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council and a senior advisor at McClarty Association, uh, Associates. She's also been a uh, vice president of the Atlantic Council and is a well-known expert both on transatlantic economic and trade relations generally and the digital piece of that relationship in particular. Daniel Hamilton is professor at SAIS, uh, the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC, where he leads the program on US, Europe and the world order in the new SAIS Foreign Policy Institute. And he previously founded and directed the Center of Trans for Transatlantic Relations um, at SAIS. He also held office uh, in the US government as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe some years ago. Aline Carmack is the Senior Fellow in Government Studies at the Brookings Institution, the perhaps the most famous think tank in the world, I think still. Uh, she's an expert not only on electoral politics, where she's written uh, definitive books on the nominating process, primary politics, but also about the administrative system and governance and government uh, in the executive branch, why presidents fail and the end of government as we know it. Uh, she worked for Pres uh, Vice President Al Gore um, in the um, uh, Clinton administration. And last but not least, Bruce Stokes, who's executive director of the Transatlantic Task Force uh, of the German Marshall Fund, having previously worked for many years uh, as the director for global economic attitudes at the Pew Research Center, the um, nonpartisan opinion polling organization in Washington, DC. And he's also previously international economics columnist for the National Journal, where he wrote uh, many articles over many years about US external trade policy. So uh, across the piece, therefore, we have four of the leading commentators, not only on domestic, but also on international uh, politics. And I'd like to uh, hand the floor to them. And uh, Elaine is going to lead off, where she's going to, I think, paint something of the domestic political context in which now the Biden administration uh, unrolls. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Anthony, and welcome, everyone. Good afternoon in, in Europe, and good morning here. Um, let me paint the broad picture, particularly concentrating on domestic. Um, Biden has three big jobs before him in the first 100 days. Uh, the biggest one is to get hold of this pandemic, particularly the vaccinations. We are in the midst of a lot of criticism because some states are some states are holding vaccines but not getting them to where they belong, which is inside people's arms. So there's a lot of confusion about that. A lot of you know criticism being directed at at uh, governors and some real anomalies. Um, you have wealthy, highly educated states like Maryland and Massachusetts being sort of doing a not very good job at this. And then you have poorer states, rural states like North Dakota, uh, West Virginia, Alaska, um, getting lots of people vaccinated. So we're looking into that and, and the Biden administration is throwing a lot of money and a lot of resources towards trying to get these vaccines in people's arms. Um, and of course, the, the most important thing that the president did yesterday was order another 200 million doses of the vaccine, which is, is critical because we need probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 260 million to be vaccinated here. 
Um, the, along with that, the, the, the sort of other priority, of course, is to pass another COVID relief bill. Um, this is to get money into the pockets of people who are uh, unemployed um, and to provide extra money to the states for this vaccination rollout. That's the big deal. Now, the the first thing the president can do with a lot of executive authority. The second thing he needs Congress. So let's get to Congress. In, in the first hundred days, he needs Congress to do two things: pass this COVID relief bill and um, confirm his nominees for office. So far, he's only got four people confirmed, although there are hearings scheduled. And of course, one of the things that happened was you had this long, contentious transition where the outgoing team didn't cooperate with the incoming team. Um, the complication to all of this, as I'm sure you're aware, is that uh, yesterday the uh, House passed the article of Im article. There's only one of impeachment over to the Senate, um, and the Senate is going to have to have a trial. Now it looks like they've worked out a deal where the Senate will do their business, whether it's nominations or uh, COVID relief or something else, um, while also beginning the impeachment trial on February the 9th. And that's obviously a confounding factor in all of this. Um, even though the, the uh, Democrats won the White House decisively, uh, the margin in the Senate is non-existent. It's a 50-50 margin, which means that Vice President Harris is going to have to be in Washington a lot of the time to break ties. Um, and in the House, the Democrats actually lost members, which means that their their margins are thin. They they really can't afford to lose many people. So that's this this drama of getting COVID in under control and getting the team in place is going to and impeaching Donald Trump or convicting Donald Trump or voting one way or another is going to dominate the first hundred days. And the subtext to all of this is what is happening to the Republican Party. Is it going to split in two um, irreparably or will somehow they all coalesce under Donald Trump or not under Donald Trump? And that, I think, is the other thing that we're watching very carefully in this first hundred days. Thank you very much in, in, indeed, Elaine. I much appreciate that. And I know you have to go in, in I think, on the hour. So um, uh, we'll try and be as... Uh, as 9.15 9 or so. Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll be as tight as possible. I have actually an immediate follow-up question because there may not be so many opportunities to ask you later on, which is I think it's the 14th Amendment of the Constitution offers a route which might allow Congress by a simple majority to a legislative act, I think, of Congress that might enable... Uh, the, the former president to be debarred from holding office is and there's a big legal debate going on about this. I think yeah. Philip Selikoff and others have been in on this. What's your take on that possibility that it might not require the two thirds majority in the Senate, but rather simple majorities in both simple houses? Um, I, I don't think that will fly. And I, I don't I mean, a lot of people have been interested in it. The problem is, if you look at the history of that amendment and that piece of the amendment, it was directed towards former office holders and military officers in the Confederacy who were already basically accused of sedition by an insurrection by the very fact that they held office. Um, the most people I've talked to think that to use that aspect of the 14th Amendment, you'd have to convict Donald Trump of sedition outside of the Congress in the courts, and then Congress could vote to do that. So I, I don't, I mean, it's an intriguing possibility, but I don't think either legally or politically, the will is there to do it. I think people are gonna stick to the uh, conviction route and impeachment. Thank you for that. I'd now like to go over to Fran Burwell, who's going to, uh, I think, cast the net slightly wider on the transatlantic relationship. Over to you, Fran. Great to see you, as always. Great, to see, great to see you too, Anthony, and thanks very much for inviting me to this. I agree very much with what Elaine has um, set out as the domestic priorities and also the, uh, the challenges that the president is going 
to face. Um, and I think that, you know, when we talk about the first 100 days, we're basically talking about between January 20th and May 1st, thereabouts. And that's not a very long period of time. Um, he has to get his officials in place and he has to deal with the challenges that she outlined. Um, and this is key in establishing the credibility of the administration for the rest of its term. You can recover. A lot of US administrations have a perfectly horrible first six months. That's not unusual. We're not expecting that, particularly from the Biden administration, because they've all been in office a zillion times before. So, but it is a possibility, so you can recover, but it is a challenge. Um, so what do we expect by May 1st? Uh, Elaine outlined some of the challenges in terms of appointments, but I would say uh, that we will see most of the cabinet confirmed by mid-February. That is late. But I think that that's about the time that we'll see, except for a few outliers. Um, there will be a few non-cabinet level people who run into trouble. There always are. It's kind of like the European Parliament always wanting to take down at least one commissioner designate. So, I mean, there is somewhat of the same dynamic there. Um, however, the undersecretaries who are key and the assistant secretaries are unlikely to be confirmed with any regularity until I would, I would guess late February or March. And I think it's uh, good to recognize that as of this morning, there was no Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, not named, so not even designated. And the Assistant Secretary for European Affairs also has not been named. There are rumors about front runners but we don't have the person, so they haven't actually started the whole process yet. Um, it took, uh, when the Obama, first Obama administration came in and Phil Gordon was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, he did not sit in his desk at the State Department until sometime in May. So I think that's where we have to um, kind of aim as, as our expectation. Uh, they have appointed in an acting capacity, Phil Reeker as the acting assistant secretary who has been in that spot and is a career official, well known in Europe. He has been, he is still there and they have a brand new deputy assistant secretary, Molly Montgomery, who is handling the EU portfolio, the Western Europe EU spot. Um, deputy assistant secretaries do not require confirmation. And so we can expect to see high level confirmation and people who don't require confirmation at a lower level coming in. For example, Christopher Hoff has been appointed as the Deputy Assistant Secretary in Commerce to lead the Privacy Shield negotiations. Very interesting that that has been done so quickly and a good sign. Um, as for the new ambassador to the EU, that is going to take a while to, to spin out. Um, ambassadorships don't usually happen except for a few, like to the UN. Uh, until later in the in the process, but I'm convinced that this time the ambassador to the EU will not be as much of an afterthought as it has been in the past. Um, but we just don't know at this point. Um, one point I would say, though, is that Blinken only received Blinken had 22 nays in his confirmation vote yesterday, and I thought that was a pretty high number of of no votes. Um, given that there has been a kind of let the president have his people, there's been that attitude in the past. So I don't know if this is part of our, I suspect it's part of our very partisan environment in which we live right now. The second thing that we will see in the first uh, 100 days is we'll have an idea of how the administration works. And everything so far indicates that this will be a very professional, experienced administration. If you're going to get 30 executive orders out in the first week, you know how to plan, you know how to anticipate, you know how to prioritize. So that's actually a very good sign. Um, it shows that they're capable of working on several policy agendas, that they're not gonna wait around for Congress. Yes, they want the COVID relief package, but they're not gonna wait for everything. They'll be able to move on other fronts. So when you hear people say, domestic will triumph foreign policy, yeah, but this 
administration to date looks like it can walk and chew gum at the same time. So uh, we've had the calls with major leaders in Europe and um, have, have been going on, even while the president has been working on these other issues. Also, they're not interested in the White House in exacerbating divisions. They haven't been particularly supportive of the impeachment, uh, of the impeachment effort. And we'll just have to see uh, whether that is the, remains the case. By the 1st of May, I would expect that we would also see a better indication of priorities. And in terms of foreign policy or things that cross the domestic foreign policy divide, you know, take what Elaine said, it's, that's exactly right domestically. Um, but beyond that, climate, and here we have the Kerry appointment, and throughout the government, the appointments we're seeing at the Energy Department and elsewhere are from a lot of climate people. So that's a, it's a significant change. Um, we have democracy is the second priority, I would say. And here we'll have to see how the summit of democracies that the president has proposed uh, becomes a reality and what that means. But there are lots of domestic issues with that as well. And here I would throw in as well the potential reform of Section 230 of the uh, community um, of the CDA and uh, what that means for free speech and also for the tech companies. And then, of course, alliances, not just with Europe, but around the world, multilateralism. This will be a huge thing uh, for this administration. Already in the phone call with Secretary General Stoltenberg, the president uh, confirmed Article 5. Remember, this is a statement that it took past the May summit uh, to get President Trump to confirm and became a big brouhaha. One thing we have seen already that is not going to be a priority is trade. And uh, I think we knew that from the campaign, but the executive order the other day on Buy America, I think only made it crystal clear. Um, Public procurement is a big issue in any major trade deal. And the fact that the president is, is essentially launching a protectionist measure or strengthening the protectionist impulses that we have around public procurement uh, indicates that he's not ready to go out with a major negotiation. Um, he is going to address some of the domestic issues that have weakened the consensus about trade in this country first before trying to do things like that. So on trade, I think that we're likely to see smaller deals, if anything. Um, but for neither a, I don't think any of us were expecting a revived TTIP, but for a bigger deal with the EU and perhaps potentially a deal with the UK, this can be very problematic. Um, so then I would say, well, what about Europe? Where does Europe fall into all of this? And there has been a lot of talk among those going into the administration and those who are advisors of the, at the campaign level about the importance of the European Union. And I take it as, as a real reflection of what they mean. Um, but I think that we have testing times ahead. We have to figure out how to work with the EU and as one person said to me, as our colleague said to me the other day, the United States really doesn't have a strategic approach to the EU. We kind of do one issue here and one issue there and don't really think about it uh, in terms of the whole of the, of the beast. Um, also, the EU is a very frustrating animal to deal with at times, let's be frank. And so it may be that we'll see an initial rush of enthusiasm and then people pulling back and saying, how do we actually work with this creature? So I think that that is uh, a real danger that will probably hit about the 100 days or the six month mark. I think if you wanna look at what's gonna happen in Europe, I would point to June, because that's when we're hearing about the G7. That's when travel will probably become um, more possible. And I think that we will probably see in, in June a major coming together physically um, potentially, this will be the first trip of the president to Europe, and we could see all rolled into one big shiny package, uh, the G7, a NATO leaders meeting, um, USEU, and potentially the Munich Security Conference as well, which has always been uh, something that President Biden has enjoyed a great deal. 
Um, so what do we need to do between now and then? We need to figure out something about steel and aluminum tariffs. And it's not clear to me that this administration will simply lift those without getting something in return, given their stance on trade and, and their domestic constituencies. We need the US-German relationship to be on a better footing. And this will include the resolution of sanctions on Nord Stream 2. Uh, we need a way forward on the JCPOA. We need the US and Europe to know what they want to ask the Iranians and how that lifts sanctions on European companies who want to be doing business in Iran and were starting to do business before the US walked away. Um, we need a more common approach to Russia. And here, the Navalny episode right now offers an opportunity to start figuring that out and a more common approach to China. So, and then finally, uh, it would be nice to put the bow on the package to have the, a Boeing Airbus resolution. But I'm less sanguine about that because it's not clear to me that uh, multiple administrations have let that just go on and on and on. So it's not clear to me that solving it really gives the administration a big bump in anything that it really cares about. Um, what about the EU? And let me just very briefly say the joint agenda that has been put forward by the Commission and, and the other institutions um, is like a laundry list. It needs more focus. So what can we pick from those things that will move forward? Two particular areas, digital, and I'm happy to talk a lot more about that in the Q&A, but digital, there's a whole, there's a tsunami of EU regulation coming our way in the next few months, starting with the DSA, the DMA, the DGA, um, and others. So the administration will have to respond and they're not yet ready to respond. And so we have a disjuncture of timing there. Secondly, the Green Deal, uh, the new administration is likely to be very interested in a lot of the things that are mentioned there. And so the question is, how do the US and the EU work together to create regulatory standards in that area uh, that are really world leading? So that it's not the EU going off and doing one thing and us going off and doing another thing. And I'll stop there because I've talked too long. <laughs> Thank you. No, you didn't talk too long at all. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Brian. Really Thanks. appreciate it. And now straight over to Dan Hamilton, who I'm sure has got um, an equally in, in the perspective on these very issues. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, well, I think Fran has sort of covered the front, so um, I'm just going to, you know, agree with sort of the framing that she gave. Um, but I, you know, I think the context is we do have a moment here, potentially fleeting, to reset the US-EU agenda. Uh, and as has been mentioned, you know, Joe Biden has said forever that Europe is, quote, partner, first resort uh, for the United States. Uh, the first where you turn to when you want to consider any real uh, challenge of any import. Uh, Mr. Burrell echoed those same words, actually, uh, last fall. The EU paper has basically said the same thing. President von der Leyen just the other day in Davos, the Davos uh, virtual event, uh, said essentially the same thing. And Charles Michel has also said, you know, let's create a founding pact, he said. So I think we have a moment to do what Fran indicated, is to try to figure out how to make the us EU relationship actually strategic. Uh, it is, <clears throat> NATO is still the institutional expression of the transatlantic link, and it'll remain that. And I believe the president will try to usher in a strategic concept review for the alliance, which is the sort of the guiding, guiding document, you know, for the alliance, it's 10 years old, it's way out of date, and sort of point the alliance to the future. And that'll probably take place over the course of this year. <clears throat> but the potential second anchor of our relationship is the US-EU uh, partnership. And yet we've always struggled to make it work. Um, so uh, I would simply suggest we should go back to that and sort of basic first principles. I think both Elaine and Fran said the 
context right now, clearly, on both sides of the Atlantic, it's not the Biden administration, it's all of Europe. We're facing a massive pandemic, and a major you know, uh, economic uh, slowdown induced by the pandemic. And if, unless we lead our societies from sickness to health, uh, the rest, frankly, is not going to matter all that much. So uh, that's our common priority. Uh, you know, this is not an American priority versus some other European priorities. This is, we are both in this, as is the world. So if we want to reassert transatlantic leadership, it will be to, uh, you know, see how we can harness together our strengths to uh, clear away hurdles to vaccines, medical innovation, uh, the scientific innovation that produced the, the vaccine was an unprecedented example of what Atlantic collaboration can do. Uh, we need to mobilize that not only across the Atlantic, but globally. Uh, so that's clear priority. <clears throat> it would seem to me some sort of transatlantic recovery initiative that incorporates both economic and the health elements would be a useful uh, first step. Because it's rooted in the second element, that is foreign policy begins at home more than ever. Uh, and unless we show our citizens that policy, you know, helps us make makes us stronger at home. It's, it's not going to win. You know, big ambitious proposals aren't going to win much support. So we're starting from that emphasis. And I think, frankly, in Europe, there's a similar sense that this has to be the priority. But let's, you know, that's not a either or question. I think uh, we should, you know, domestic self renewal is just self evident on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but we're unlikely to achieve those domestic goals unless we incorporate foreign policy goals and harness the broad range of our partnership to to work on them. And Tony Blinken said that basically yesterday. Uh, so I would suggest we you know think about practical steps <clears throat> forward, grounded in this sober reality that we're facing right now. Um, the second, I think, we. US-EU relationship, the EU paper, for instance, proposed a whole series of things. Uh, and, you know, there's a tendency to think of US-EU foreign policy partnership, uh, and there'll be an instinct to, you know, try to align on many of those issues. It'll, that'll come quickly, relatively easily in terms of starting those discussions, not maybe easily on some of the particular issues, but the instinct is to do this now again together. And that's so it's rooted in a sense of opportunity and possibility rather than treating each other as foes, which has been the last number of years. Um, but I think the insight to a more strategic USC re relationship is to understand our relationship is about more than foreign policy. The more the more far reaching possibilities for the US EU partnership are in fact beyond foreign policy. We extend to all sorts of areas because we are still more deeply interconnected across the Atlantic, our societies, than either of our societies are with any other continent. This is simply still the case. And so sort of an intermestic, you know, understanding of US-EU relationship is really critical. So those areas include health now. The health agenda is a major one. Besides what I mentioned, uh, you see the administration on day one said we're not only you know still in the WHO, but we want to work with our European partners to help reform it. Uh, they have said we will supply funding and join the COVAX initiative, uh, which has 190 countries to help you know 92 uh, less developing countries get the vaccine. <clears throat> the U.S. Congress in bipartisan legislation approved billions of dollars for the Gavi uh, vaccine alliance. So the U.S. is back on that track and wants to work with the EU. We need to now uh, do that together. The second area, which I think I was surprised the EU paper actually just punted on, didn't even mention, unbelievable, big hole, is what I call the resilience agenda, transatlantic resilience. The pandemic is sort of the most emblematic example that our societies today are so deeply connected that the critical functions of societies are also very susceptible to disruption, either Mother Nature, as we see, or frankly, intentional actors who can disrupt all the critical infrastructures, all the flows that bind our societies, 
And we are increasingly vulnerable to that because that's the nature of open societies. And yet we failed <clears throat> to sort of identify resilience in an operational way. People like to talk about it as a buzzword. But I think we have an opportunity to make this an operational priority uh, across the Atlantic. There is a NATO piece to it, but frankly, most of it is US-EU uh, or with member states. So I would argue uh, we have a major opportunity uh, to come around and resilience agenda. Uh, and I was struck by how uh, absent that was in the EU concept. Fran was right on the digital uh, economy. I think that is a major uh, opportunity for it. The, you know, transatlantic theater is still the fulcrum of global digital connectivity. Uh, we Together, we produce 75% of digital content globally, 75%. And we're far more interconnected than any other two continents. Uh, and the digital economy is becoming the economy. But in order to harness that opportunity, we have to be frank that we are bumping into each other and we're going to have to clear away a whole series of digital disconnects that have appeared across the Atlantic. The US EU privacy shield you know, was invalidated by the European court. Uh, they've already appointed somebody to start renegotiating, but it's a really a fundamental difference about legal regimes. I'm not sure you can just have now another renegotiation. This is a more fundamental issue we have. Uh, so I joined those the US EU dialogue on data governance so that we can address not only this issue, but the online platform issues, uh, a whole series of uh, questions of data governance and how we address standard setting on digital issues in international organizations because the Chinese are present and we have failed to show up uh, for a long time. Um, the whole digital taxation issue, I think the administration is inclined to go back to the OECD and to trying to find a multilateral solution, but that's not going to happen uh, quickly. Um, and uh, that's still a source of tension, but perhaps there is a way forward on that, but it has to be cleared away. I agree also with Fran on the other area, which is the, you know, what I would call transatlantic green deal. <clears throat> uh, both sides of the Atlantic now have said, not only are they committed to the Paris climate goals, they're committed to net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and there's a whole environmental agenda there that will now unite us. But we have to understand that the green deal uh, are changing you know, uh, the way our economy works is about more than the environment. Uh, we have to ground in a narrative that is a positive narrative about inclusive and sustainable growth and better jobs. Uh, that we're, we're talking about transformation of the entire model of our society and trying to break the link between the production of wealth and the consumption of resources. That's an historic, you know, turn. Uh, it has to be crafted in a way that our citizens believe that is a positive for their daily lives and their livelihoods. And too, too much of it has been crafted only as an environmental agenda. It's much more than that. So I think we should harness that energy. It's a positive moment. The first test will become, we become the carbon border adjustment mechanism the EU is uh, considering. Uh, I believe the United States will probably consider a similar mechanism. We need to work together to make sure that type of mechanism, whatever it is, is WTO uh, compatible. Uh, and we should do it together rather than one side get out in front of the other. Um, so if we you know, talk about all these issues, health, climate, resilience, uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, domestically strong ec economy, digital, that's a big agenda where the US-EU partnership is actually front and center. And then we have to we have to make that the frame and not just foreign policy, uh, realizing we have some real issues across the Atlantic on some of the points we mentioned. My last point, I agree with Fran, there's not a big trade agenda right now <clears throat> because we have to clear away some of the problems. But if we can root it in this notion that we are both stronger at home by reviving our economies, that positions us for considering maybe some more ambitious elements later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, Thank for that. Much, Dan, uh, for that. Uh, the, the work on resilience, resilience. Uh, is being undertaken inside the EU, but it's obviously not yet being shared uh, on a transatlantic basis. It's it's central to the agenda of Vice President Sefcovic, and indeed in our own European Parliamentary Research Service here in uh, Brussels. 
Uh, we have been doing quite a lot of work on risks, capabilities, resi resilience within the system, and um, hopefully that can be shared more widely. Thanks uh, for that great intervention, really appreciate it. Now we're going to go, last but not least, to Bruce Stokes, who I think is in Boston. Uh, and Bruce, in addition to talking about transatlantic, on which you're, of course, a, a very uh, acknowledged expert, I'd just like to ask you in a way a framing question, which is how strong or how brittle do you think the mandate of President Biden is going forward? I mean, he talks about healing America and obviously both the election and indeed the whole of the Trump presidency has revealed a deeply divided society and opened the eyes of the world really to a number of long term trends which have been developing uh, over time. But how far has he got the kind of mandate that would enable him to engage seriously in that healing process? Or is it beyond the capability of him individually or indeed any president at this moment? Uh, it's great to be with everyone. Um, and uh, I certainly endorse uh, uh, most of the points that uh, my the predecessors have, have uh, laid out, uh, I think uh, there's a lot that can be done in the transatlantic relationship. I, th I think your question is on the mark as to, to what extent can the Biden administration uh, unite the American people and then uh, deliver on some of these opportunities that uh, were spelled out uh, before me. Um, we should uh, bear in mind that uh, the president uh, ran saying he was a uniter, that he wanted to unite the country. And certainly uh, that is an element in almost every speech he gives. Um, yet when uh, uh, in exit polling data, uh, people were asked after they voted, what were the personal characteristics that they wanted in the next president? And they were given, I think, five different alternatives. Only 19% of the public said that uh, uh, someone who could unite the country was important to them. So. Uh, it, it has an appeal at a, at a very kind of 30,000 foot level for people, but it not necessarily, it's not necessarily a priority. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, the country remains deeply, deeply divided. It is true that Donald Trump lost, uh, but I think there's a strong argument to say that Trumpism is not dead uh, and, in fact, uh, is uh, quite strong. Uh, 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 in a survey done uh, uh, right before the election, uh, eight in 10 uh, Democrats have a negative view of, of Republicans, more than eight in 10, and eight in 10 Republicans have a negative view of Democrats. So, so there's, a, there's a deep animosity towards each other. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Trump voters, three quarters of Trump voters say that uh, uh, Democrats do not uh, share the same core American values and goals as, as they do. And 80% of uh, uh, Biden voters said those other guys don't share American values either. So again, a, on a very fundamental level, we, we uh, uh, don't look at each other as being uh, a, a one people. Um, and, and you see this in the name calling, basically, uh, eight in 10 uh, Republicans say that uh, Democrats, Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists, and eight in 10 Democrats say that the Republican Party has been taken over by racists. Um, and when you have that kind of raw sentiment about each other, it's very difficult to see how you uh, have uh, uh, compromises with each other. Uh, and, and certainly uh, the surveys that have been done since the election show that um, uh, it is particularly uh, the case among, say, people who are self-identified as Trump Republicans. Only 25% of them say the Republican Party should compromise with Biden. Uh, and um, so it, to have compromise at the legislative level in the Congress, you need to have support on both sides for compromise. Uh, if only one side wants to compromise, uh, you can't you can't make a deal. Um, so there's that challenge that that the president faces. Uh, we also have to remind ourselves that um, despite the fact that he won uh, an electoral college victory, 
and he actually carried uh, uh, the popular vote, which remember, Trump did not carry the popular vote. Uh, if you look back at uh, the coattails that presidents had uh, going into office uh, in times of, of national challenge, national troubles, uh, Biden won the popular vote by about four and a half percent. Uh, Obama in 2008, at the time of the financial crisis, uh, won the popular vote by over 7%. And more importantly, while Biden picked up two seats in the U.S. Senate, which, as Elaine pointed out, without that, nothing, we wouldn't be having this conversation because the Republicans would be in control of the Senate. Um, Obama picked up eight seats in that in the 2008 election in the U.S. Senate and 21 seats in the House, whereas uh, Biden lost seats, his party lost seats in the House of Representatives. Um, so his uh, hold on uh, the, the ability to get things done in Congress is very tenuous. Um, uh, and his party faces a cliff in uh, 2022. We know uh, from historical experience that the uh, Obama administration and the Clinton administration, after two years in office, their party lost dramatically in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Democratic Party, if it loses, not even dramatically, it's semi-dramatically uh, in 2022, will lose control of the House of Representatives. So uh, they're, they're, they have a very short period of time to get things done and a very uh, tenuous control on things. The good news, I think, and that we that our foreign audience, a European audience, should draw heart from is that public opinion polls show that Biden's base, his Democratic Party base, is strongly supportive of a range of issues that um, uh, foreigners, Europeans in particular, I think would support. We find from public opinion data that Democrats are more likely than Republicans to say the government can learn from other countries. You know, fundamental issue of, you know, is there anything to learn by talking to allies? Um, and Democrats overwhelmingly believe we have something to learn from allies on climate change, on uh, what to, how to deal with the coronavirus, how to improve the economy. Um, when, uh, when asked uh, in the U.S., uh, Democrats are much more likely than Republicans to support various forms of international cooperation uh, and to believe that the United States uh, should take into account uh, the interests of other countries when we make foreign policy, which uh, by definition is, 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 is a commitment to multilateralism that certainly is absent among Republicans uh, in, in these polls. Um, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, released a survey before the election showing that by three to one, uh, Democrats want to do more free trade agreements. By three to one, they want to reduce tariffs, not increase tariffs. And by three to one, they are in favor of increasing our commitment to defend our allies' security. So again, on a series of issues of cooperation with uh, Europe and with our other allies, uh, Biden's base does support him. Uh, the question is, of course, whether uh, he can translate that base support into congressional support to actually accomplish things. Because I think the thing that we have to uh, remind ourselves of is that uh, while the Democrats can, through uh, what's called a reconciliation process in the US uh, Congress, uh, vote by a simple majority uh, some uh, legislation that involves budgetary matters, uh, some of the broader uh, uh, initiatives that I think would be supported by Europeans and we look they look to the United States to accomplish, uh, uh, which are not budgetary in nature, are going to be much more difficult to get through this uh, deeply divided Congress. Um, and um, that will lead the president, uh, as he's already done, uh, to uh, uh, sign executive orders, to try to, by executive action, to uh, uh, pursue policies. Uh, Obama did a lot of that. Trump did a lot of that. 
Biden has already begun to do a lot of that. Um, uh, what this says about the dysfunctionality of the U.S. legislative system, I think, is self-evident that the Congress cannot act in many cases. But we should also draw a lesson from the Trump era that executive actions can be blocked by the courts. And when they were Trump executive actions, people applauded in Europe uh, and in many parts of the United States. Uh, bear in mind that one of the first uh, executive actions by, the, by President Biden was to put a hold on deportation, detention and deportation of uh, undocumented uh, people in the United States. Uh, a Texas court yesterday, conservative Texas judge appointed by Trump, uh, blocked the attempt to block the action. So in other words, the policy remains in place. Uh, we're likely to see more of that uh, conservative judicial response to uh, attempts by Biden and the Biden administration to uh, move on issues of interest to the world um, uh, because of the of the division in the United States. So I think it's a mixed picture uh, of what we can accomplish or can, what we should be expected to be able to accomplish uh, because of the political divisions that ex continue to exist in the United States. So I look forward to people's comments and questions. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, we're now bang on time. It was foreseen that at 15.20, the presentations would end, and indeed they have. Thank you to all four panelists. I know Elaine's already had to leave, but we appreciate the fact that she was able to spend 45 minutes with us. Uh, and I should add about Bruce that in the um, seminar that we did just before the election, uh, where we had, I think, six or so commentators, you, I think, were the only person who predicted that Donald Trump would increase his vote in the presidential election. Um, and so the question was, not that he wouldn't do well, but whether he would do as well as his opponent. Um, and you drew, I think, that from your own experience in Pennsylvania, where I believe you, you grew, grew up. That was was a fascinating insight, and it was vindicated. So the posters were right, at least in, in that regard. <laughs> um, so uh, we're already getting questions in. And please, if anybody else who hasn't already asked a question would like to do so, we're about 130 people still online, which is great. And I'm going to pose straight away a question, in fact, two parallel questions. And in a way, they're linked by Andreas uh, uh, Strignitz um, from within the Parliament Secretariat, who asks, uh, what do you think the Biden administration's attitude is going to be to the growing emphasis in uh, the European Union on strategic uh, autonomy? Do they see that or will they see that as a complement to or weakening of the transatlantic partnership potentially. It reminds me of a quote from Henry Kissinger, which I think I've used on a previous occasion, but which I think is very pertinent when he said back in 1969, just before he became national security advisor, that the Europe, that the United States had spent the post-war era uh, hoping for building for European unity, but recoiling from, from its potential consequences. <laughs> um, and now we see that, and I'm, therefore I ask uh, the parallel question that Andreas has put, What's the reading in Washington of the EU-China investment uh, agreement? Uh, the official line uh, out of the Berlin Wall is it's nothing more, or the EAS, is that it's nothing more than Europe essentially securing the same kind of arrangements that the United States has. Is that well-founded among those who know anything about it? I'm going to ask uh, Dan first, because I think he's already expressing a desire to at least for a minute. Thank you. <clears throat> I think on the first question, where we agree is with global Europe. You will find strong support in the United States for that proposition, that we need a Europe that's more capable in bringing stability, prosperity to its own continent, to quelling violence around its peripheries, and to being a counterpart and not a counterweight to the United States when it comes to a whole host of global challenges. Unfortunately, I think <clears throat> instead of focusing on capabilities, we focus uh, and get distracted by terminologies. Uh, and this term is one of them. Um, I'm not, I still don't understand what it is, and I actually work on these issues. And frankly, if I may say, I don't think there's much consensus in Europe if you really scratch the surface behind the term, nor a lot of understanding about it either. I have to tell you, I've had multiple calls 
from Central and East European EU member states asking me very nervously, you know, how do we get out of this bind? This term is, you know, a problem. Uh, and, you know, how do you understand it? They ask me because uh, they don't get it themselves. Uh, and there are two pieces to it, you know, strategic and autonomy. Um, I'm not sure what it means. Uh, if you're in a deep marriage, uh, you know, and you, one partner says to the other, we want to be autonomous from you, uh, you don't quite know what to think of that. Uh, uh, and it's couched often in an emancipatory tone, not about Europe being able to take the capable actions and build the capacities that we're talking about, but in sort of just getting you know less dependent on the United States. Um, if the Europe was serious about that, it would do lots of things, which brings me to the strategic part of that. Strategic, if you want to follow the ultimate logic, means that Europe's ability to have a nuclear deterrence to defend itself against uh, potential threats. There's, there's, you know, we're not anywhere close to that. Even the French proponents of the term have shied away from extending the French deterrent to anybody else. So I, it's a confusing term. It's a nebulous term. There's no consensus in Europe on the term. And it gets in the way of what could be a very productive discussion about a Europe that's more capable. If French soldiers could fly to the Sahel and to Africa without getting on US airplanes, for instance, that would be a contribution. Uh, if ESCO and EDF uh, uh, issues could give us the list of things they're actually gonna produce that will make Europe more capable, that would be a contribution. But it, it in the United States, it's always seen as just more process and political jargon rather than uh, real stuff. And I think you'll find an equally uh, skeptical U.S. approach to that, although they'll be more diplomatic about it. Uh, on the on the U.S. on the EU China, you know, I, I'm taking this a, a less. Uh, uh, I say I'm not getting less. I'm getting less worked up about it because I don't think the the way the agreement now is is the way any agreement will actually turn out to be. Uh, there is massive opposition. I think I talked to members in the European Parliament made up to 400 votes against this in the European Parliament. Uh, the, the comparison to the U.S. phase one deal is a false analogy because the China-U.S., the China-EU agreements about investment and the U.S.-China thing was about trade. Uh, there's some overlap, but they're not actually about the same issues. Uh, so it's not a, it's not a thing. And understanding some of the details, especially about weak China, Chinese uh, commitments to uh, slave labor uh, and so on, uh, that's not going to stand within Europe. There's going to be a huge backlash. <clears throat> None of these kinds of agreements as put forward by the commission usually end up being the ones that are the final one. Even the CETA agreement, I mean, it's with Canada. Uh, it isn't exactly, you know, where it is now. It hasn't even been ratified yet by the Dutch, uh, and that's Canada. So I, I, I really don't see uh, this going to be uh, going on. I think this whole year will be an internal European debate about the provisions of it. In the meantime, in the, you know, the European view, particularly the German view at the time, was to wrap it up by their presidency and show some, uh, some product, if you will, of the presidency. It was seen as a commercial deal. The Chinese, though, see it as a political deal, and they have already been using this, and they've already said very frankly uh, in their own media uh, to their own people, look, we can counteract the provisions we made in the deal by other legislation, and they've already done that. Uh, so uh, I really don't see a whole lot. It was an irritant, uh, but I, as I said, I don't think it'll be actually the real thing that we see. So. Uh, I'm not sure that it'll it'll get in the way too much. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask Fran next to come in, and I'm going to perhaps also uh, put in the mix another question that's come in, as well as the two that um, I'd like you to comment on, and that's from Elena Lazarou, um, where she says, uh, "Could you perhaps comment on the nomination of Susan Rice as director of the Domestic Policy Council?" And does this foreshadow a greater kind of and stronger interface between internal and external policy coordination in the Biden administration? And in parallel to that, uh, Samantha Power's nomination to the USAID agency should we therefore expect a renewed emphasis on the um, SDGs 
and the potential for stronger transatlantic partnership in that field. So over to you, Fran. Let me first talk about a little bit about the strategic autonomy. I think that the um, US is to some degree schizophrenic about the EU and always has been. So there's a desire to see the EU strong and united, capable, as Dan puts it, and, and that's very genuine for most of the political uh, class. But there is also a, oh my God, they're getting their act together, what are they going to do now type of uh, reaction. And uh, we see the US veering back and forth about that. Um, and we see that the equivalent in Europe where you don't want to give up power to Brussels, but if things aren't going well, you always blame Brussels. So um, it's it's not unusual. I have to say that as this debate has uh, developed, so we had a great, uh, Dan is right that there's this reaction of if you have strategic autonomy, from whom do you have autonomy? Is it us, your partners? And so therefore people look kind of askance. There was some um, coming together to understand this term uh, at the end of the Obama administration. But then with the Trump administration, you had people coming in and uh, who did not even accept the possibility that the EU could have any sort of defense policy at all or involvement in defense and security. And uh, so now we have to rebuild what consensus there was before. In the meantime, there has been the, in the EU side, there has been the expansion of this term. In the trade field, we're now hearing about open strategic autonomy which to me is even more confusing about exactly what it means. Um, I would say that it's happening at a time when all countries, and here the Biden administration's public procurement executive order is a, an example of this, all major countries are re-examining the relationship between open international markets and their own resilience and their own ability to provide exactly what is needed for their citizens based on the experiences that we had at the early stages of the coronavirus crisis. So I, I'm not foreseeing a return to the kind of uh, liberal open markets free trading system. There will be some areas that are semi off limits and each government will figure those out in time. Um, and so it speaks more to kind of strategic autonomy, but you have to figure out how that autonomy actually works out in practice. Here I would point to also the rhetoric around digital sovereignty, um, which has not been well received in the United States. Uh, it does tend when it is used to, um, to increase the tensions around a particular issue. But the reality is we don't have a whole lot of proposals out there yet, specific proposals. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out exactly what this means and how it will be operationalized. Is it just a European reaction to the failure of Europe to develop major tech companies, with a few exceptions, um, and therefore wanting to have more control? I mean, I understand that if you, you know, if you were uh, with the, the role of U.S. tech companies in Europe, I, I get the emotional um, uh, desire to have to have more uh, sovereignty, if you will. But what does it actually mean in terms of discriminating against those companies uh, when it comes to legislation? And here, you know, that's a there are a whole bunch of different ways that that can be approached. And I think that is going to be the issue that the U.S. and the EU have to deal with, and uh, the 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 test that that we will have to face over the next year or so as this legislation, EU legislation comes down the pike. And also as the United States looks at its own privacy legislation, which I think we will be seeing over the next year or two, and perhaps also reform of, of the liability clause in um, section 230. On the EU-China investment agreement, I will just say that it has been almost uniformly um, criticized. Uh, in the circles that I go in in, in Washington. Uh, to some degree, I think this is 
making a mountain out of a molehill. I agree with Dan. This is not this. I don't know if this is ever going to become reality or not. Uh, to me, it was clearly driven by German domestic politics and and the view, the commercial view of China in that country, and particularly in the CDU. It's driven by the amb ambitions of the German presidency and the desire, uh, you know, to solidify the economic relationship with China as Germany goes into an election year. So I, that's the way I see it, but a lot of my colleagues in Washington see it as a real failure by the EU to understand the geopolitical implications of such a, an arrangement. And that is, a, to me, it's a justifiable position. I mean, you can see that, but, um, but I think it's probably being made into more than it is. Um, the nomination of Susan Rice, I think that we really see someone with whom Biden has had a very close relationship over the years, um, but who is essentially going to be extremely difficult to get confirmed. And so he had to find a place for her that was not confirmable. That means that uh, did not require Senate confirmation. Um, and that meant the White House. She's done every foreign policy job there is. She cares a great deal about these sorts of domestic issues. Uh, she was uh, on the media last night talking about the president's executive order, executive orders on racial equality and justice. So I think this is uh, more, I would describe this more as um, a trusted advisor of the president who has broadened her portfolio over her years of professional service to him. So uh, I wouldn't read a whole lot more into it uh, than that. Uh, in terms of Samantha Powers, I think this is a really interesting appointment. And I think that um, she will probably focus a lot more on how we give aid in situations of conflict. Uh, she is a longstanding Democratic uh, appointee, if you will. Uh, but I, I, I don't know enough about that field to, to talk knowledgeably about it. And I just think that what we're going to see is a more activist USAID, which has been a very weak, very weak organization, both in terms of its political clout within Washington and, it, and even its acceptance and use by the foreign policy hierarchy. Uh, you can't put someone, she's high profile and activist herself, so hardly a technocrat. So she will make the US foreign assistance program more uh, high profile in turn. Thank you very much indeed, Fran. Uh, over to you, Bruce. I'm also going to, so please comment on any of the above questions that have already been posed. But I'd also like to throw in an extra one, which is coming from Monica Mearns de Fermic, who asks a very interesting question about the Republican Party. I mean, how do you see the survival of the Republican Party in the current political scene? Is it possible that it might split in some form? Could a breakaway party survive in the um, electoral context of majoritarian electoral systems? If I'm not mistaken, my history of my knowledge of that history is a bit uh, shaky, but I think the Republican Party itself was a product of a split. So uh, it's not unknown, and you've seen center right parties in many Western democracies under pressure either splitting or seeing rivals to their right. So, how do you see that, as well as the other questions that have already been posed? Over to you, Bruce. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and I think it's probably uh, uh, one of the things that keep some Republican leaders like Mitch McConnell up at night worrying about that. Uh, that, um, And I think one of the ways you can explain the um, recent rallying of most of the Republicans around opposing impeachment, uh, around uh, uh, even uh, there was a Republican leader yesterday who said that all of America is to blame for the storming of the Capitol uh, as an attempt to uh, not alienate that Trump wing of the party that uh, officials at the state level and at the national level believe they need in the party now if the party is to have any chance of regaining power. And um, I think it's not insignificant that uh, 
President Trump, former President Trump, did make passing reference to creating a third party before he pulled back on that. And I think it was a shot across people's bow that, uh, you know, if you don't let me continue to dominate the Republican Party, uh, then I could just take my people and take my ball and go home and, and create my own party. Now, what that would mean for the Republican Party's ability to exert power, both at the congressional level or the national level, because we really never have had strong third parties in the United States. There was a brief moment where we had a number of socialists in Congress. Uh, as you say, the Whig Party broke up in the 19th century and out of that was formed the Free Soil Party and then the Republican Party. But we've never consistently had three parties working. But given the nature of our system, I think it'd be very hard to, to have that be a very effective. Uh, but I think it is the threat of the Republican Party breaking up and it wouldn't break up of its own accord. I mean, the, the Trump people would take their balls and go home and they would create their own party. That is, is keeping uh, the more establishment party in line in terms of some of these issues that the, the Trump wing of the party care about, like defending the president. Uh, uh, I think we'll see it going forward uh, in a very staunch uh, opposition to almost every Biden initiative, no matter what it is. Um, and um, to, to make another comment about this question about European autonomy and sovereignty, uh, and the China deal. I mean, first on the China deal, uh, I, I agree with Fran. I mean, I, I would say that, that the people that I talk to who are, you know, not trade experts, they're not China experts, but they're foreign policy people were offended by this. They, they, they just saw this as a, um, uh, an unnecessary uh, slap in the face to the Biden administration. I mean, Dan's right that it probably may not mean anything. It may never pass the, the European Parliament. Uh, and that might be the best thing for US-European relations that it never comes into a force. But it was a rem stark reminder, I think, to Americans that when push comes to shove, German commercial interests drive their foreign policy and still do, despite everything that's happened over the last couple of decades. Uh, and that, um, if, in fact, American hopes that we can cooperate with Europe in dealing with China in particular, uh, that obstacle to that cooperation still exists. Um, and, you know, that leads me to the, a comment on the, on the sovereignty debate. Again, I find the assertions of the sovereignty and autonomy to be largely incomprehensible once you dig down into the details of how this would actually work. And, and China is a perfect example. Um, uh, I think Europe has a legitimate historical antagonism towards the United States where they have experience where American technological leadership has put them in, the, in, a, in a second position. And, and they feel exploited by that. And it goes back to the 1960s when, you know, Servan Schreiber wrote a book called Le Défi Américain and the IBM was going to take over the world. Uh, and so there's a, there, that, there's a paranoia there, but it's also rooted in experience. Uh, but implicit in technological autonomy or sovereignty is that Europe has sufficient money, scientific talent, and market size to be a competitor with China in some of these areas of emerging technologies. I, I just think that that's just not credible and it's and it doesn't stand even a modicum of analysis. And uh, it's true the Americans have to come to the same conclusion that we need the Europeans on, on emerging technologies. I actually think there is more support for that in Silicon Valley now than there used to be, that we need to work with the Europeans on these emerging issues uh, in competition with China. It's it's not at all clear to me that there's as much support in Europe for that kind of cooperation. And that's going to be one of the obstacles I think we face in trying to face the China challenge in the digital area and the technological area. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes left uh, to take questions. And I'm going to throw out a series of questions which have come in uh, from um, the
the 118 people still who are online in no particular order and invite each of you Dan, Fran, Bruce, in that order, to pick up on any of the issues that you think interesting or important, particularly if they haven't already been raised. Uh, Andrew Bolton asks about uh, the Biden uh, presidency's attitudes to human rights in China and the Uyghur people, and how far that will be reprioritized uh, compared with the previous administration, although it's true to say the previous administration wasn't exactly friendly towards China. Uh, Mikhail Iochimescu, if I've got the pronunciation right, wonders what the prospects are for stronger regulation of hate speech in the United States and whether that could be uh, a useful component in reuniting America. Gonzalo de Mendoza asks what the outlook is on the Iranian front now. In real terms, is it likely that the deal can be um, re kind of uh, re-mementized, as it were, if that, that word exists? Christian Kura, uh, the future of NATO and US engagement in NATO, not just a formal sense like on Article 5, but in terms of using NATO as a vehicle, should its remit be extended? And that also bears upon the question which was raised earlier about the possibility of a summit or concert of democracies in some way, and whether NATO might or might not fit into that process. And then Matthew Parry asks a very interesting question, which I'm going to read out its entirety. He says, is there a mismatch between the EU's view of itself as a privileged partner to the United States and the United States' view of the EU as just one of a group of liberal democracies with which it can cooperate, whether it's on health, climate change, tech or trade, albeit the biggest. So uh, over to you. Perhaps you could limit your remarks to two, two and a half minutes each. One, one thing, if I could just uh, uh, on the on the human rights issue, because I think we, we have some sense of that. Uh, OK, you go first then, Bruce. You go first. Yeah. Um, uh, when when you look at the public opinion polls, the one issue where Republicans and Democrats agree is that uh, getting tougher with China on human rights, even at the cost of our economic relationship, is supported by three quarters of Republicans and three quarters of Democrats. So there is the potential there. And we know from public opinion surveys in Europe that one of the driving forces behind anti-Chinese sentiment in Europe is the human rights records of China. So there's a potential there, it seems to me, a political potential to build a coalition. But I think we have to be uh, honest with ourselves that uh, in the wake of Tiananmen, within six months or a year, we are all back to doing business with, with China. So the, the likelihood that we will be able to uh, sustain a human rights, a tough human rights a, a approach to China. Now, the task force I ran, we, we recommended we cooperate on, on human rights issues with China, I, I, against China. We should do that. And, and the Trump administration actually did some things in the waning days that I th think will be interesting to see whether the Biden administration undoes because they, you know, banning the purchase of certain things from uh, Uyghur forced labor camps, et cetera. The bigger issue, it seems to me, around China that no one wants to talk about is what do we and the Europeans and the Japanese do about Taiwan? Because that is, in essence, a human rights issue as well. And the pressure on Taiwan is growing. There is growing concern in the American foreign policy community about this pressure. And there's also an agreement in the highest circles in, a, in the US defense uh, establishment, we can't defend Taiwan. If, if the Chinese wanted to take it, they would take it. Now, it's a very low probability they would go that far. But what if they ratchet up the pressure on Taiwan? And if we feel the need to do something, the Japanese may feel the need to do something. But if the Europeans say, this is just not our issue, we're just out of here. Um, in the wake of the German minister asking Taiwan to increase semiconductor production because he needed the German auto industry needs more semiconductors, this, this, this is going to cause some tension in the relationship. Thanks very much. Over to Fran. So I, I would also throw into what Bruce just said. I would throw into Hong, uh, Hong Kong into that mix because I think what we've seen is uh, a very skillful use by Beijing of the same types of uh, tactics that were that were used by the Soviets at the end of the Second World War to kind of bring some of the Czechoslovakia and others under their wing more tightly. And I think that we have um, uh, a prospect with Taiwan of 
not so much military intervention, but given the growing skill of the Chinese in disinformation, of upsetting the, the delicate balance there in terms of democracy. I think that's what we need to kind of have our, our eyes on and be thinking about. And that's why I think that US, the US and the EU have a couple of major issues that we haven't touched on yet. One is when you deal with China and Russia, whom I would identify as our two strategic challenges right now, how do we do that balance between firm opposition on the things that we don't like, but also still engaging them? Because I don't think that even with what's going on with the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, and our concerns about Taiwan, I don't think we're going to see making China into uh, Iran and I don't, or Cuba, and I wouldn't argue that those two policies of the United States have been particularly successful in changing those governments, so uh, those countries. So um, I think we have to get the balance with both Russia and China of engagement and firm opposition on certain things. And, and that's something that we can only do together, because if we don't do it together, it's just simply not effective. The other area that we have some concerns about or have a real challenges about is the health of democracies around the world. And on the this runs into this question about free speech. So in Europe, there is illegal hate speech. There's also hate speech that isn't illegal. Um, we are much more in the United States. We are much more devotees of, let's say, pure free speech. It's going to be very difficult uh, for us to grapple with tightening the uh, existing protections for free speech, even to, for example, uh, raise questions about the requirement that incitement to violence uh, or to hatred be imminent in order for it to be illegal speech. So you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. That's imminent, right? An imminent danger. But the KKK can go out there and incite to hatred. But if it's not something that's going to have an immediate impact, it's protected free speech. So I don't see that we're going to necessarily have a, an agreement on this. Um, but I do think that there's a whole bunch of speech that we have struggled to deal with. And in this, I would put fake facts, conspiracy theories, um, and other things of this ilk that are in the European um, context, harmful, but not illegal. And I think we really need to talk about the impact of the speech on our societies. And it's not just the online world. If you look at the commentary on some of the traditional television channels uh, in the United States, they have been uh, spreaders of fake information and of conspiracy theories as well. So it's not just online, uh, but we have to figure out how to deal with this in a democratic framework, because these are very real um, threats to our democracy. Um, let me say on the future of NATO, there's long been a debate in the United States. You will, you'll find people say, oh, well, NATO should take over this. NATO should be doing you know, uh, protection of critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, climate impacts on infrastructure, et cetera. I think we have to um, figure out a way that we have kind of a melding uh, of what the EU brings to the table and what NATO brings to the table. And what NATO brings to the table in these areas is military, uh, mill to mill cooperation um, and the types of resources that the military can bring in emergencies floods or whatever, um, and uh, chemical, you know, chemical, biological attacks, whatever you, however you want to do it, but also natural disasters. Uh, but it's the EU that often has the budget. And one of the things I'm often struck with when you visit European foreign ministries is how much more of their time is taken up with the EU rather than NATO, which is the exact reverse in Washington 
of course, we're a member of NATO. We're not a member of the EU. But we need to figure out how, with, if you're going to expand the remit, how does it effectively sync up with what the EU is trying to do in these things? Because the first instinct of most European governments is, if we're having a crisis about something, it's the EU that starts expanding as um, its remit, as we was, have seen with COVID and with the expansion COVID now in healthcare. Now healthcare. Um, uh, I'm going to have to. Uh, uh, sorry, um, no, but I'm fine. going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to um, end your remarks at that point because we're running now critically out of time. But they were all extremely interesting, important, and to the point. And go finally to Dan, who I know has got to leave on the hour anyway, so he's under uh, tight time pressure. But we're going to have before the close of this, we're going to have a few final remarks from the head of our Washington office, Joe Dunn. Over to you, Dan have to leave right after this. Just one word on the China. You know, the Trump administration uh, designated the treatment of the Uyghurs as genocide. And in his testimony uh, before the Senate, uh, Anthony Blinken said he agreed with that assessment. So uh, having said that, uh, you'll have to see that he will have to do something to act on that statement. On Iran, it wasn't mentioned yet. Um, Clearly, uh, both sides want to go back into some form of the JCPOA, but the United States, you know, wants to broaden the agenda. It's not a, just about the nuclear deal. It is about Iran's refusal to recognize the state of Israel. It is about its support for terrorist activities across the region and beyond. Um, and it's uh, sort of undermining of its own neighbors. Uh, so there's a, there's a bigger agenda with Iran that it, than just the nuclear deal. The question will be how we package that in a way that preserves a transatlantic sort of uh, approach. Uh, but I think today it's not the transatlantic problem with Iran now. Uh, it'll be Iran itself. Um, on NATO, I agree with Fran's point. It's about how NATO fits, not always about what NATO should just do, considered on its own. Um, but I, you know, if you allow me, just my one brief take on what where NATO is and where it needs to go. I mentioned there will be a strategic concept review. That's the guiding documents for the alliance. So let me just give you my take on what that should say. I think it's what I call one plus four. Uh, the one is a reaffirmation that a NATO is an alliance of values and of democracies. Uh, that has gotten lost uh, over the last number of years, a lot of backsliding, including by the United States. Uh, you believe, uh, you know, you can bet Joe Biden will affirm the value of NATO. He calls it, quote, a sacred duty. So uh, he will try to reinvigorate the alliance, but not go back to something. So the, the underpinning has to be the one, a reaffirmation of values, uh, alliance of democracies. The four are the core tasks of NATO. There are three core, current core tasks, which I think probably will withstand review, uh, but need to be updated. One is collective defense, the other is crisis management, and the third is cooperative security. Each of them needs uh, sort of a refurbishing. The fourth, though, I would argue is in fact what I said earlier, what I would call comprehensive resilience. Resilience needs to be lifted as a core task for NATO. It cuts across so many other issues that, in many ways, is what most citizens worry about today, is disruption. Cyber is one sort of emblematic, but uh, all sorts of other things. It's not a NATO-only uh, issue, but resilience, you know, frankly, for all the talk about strategic autonomy and all this other stuff, uh, EU-NATO cooperation, the leading edge of that is actually in resilience right now. That's where the two institutions are working most closely together. So you can advance that agenda, but you have to lift it in the NATO space. Last point was on the EU and this notion, you know, different concepts. Uh, I think what Fran said earlier, I've said a long time, for European observers, you have to understand, the US always goes through a cycle whenever the EU comes up with some initiative. First, it's dismissed. They're not serious. Secondly, oh my God, they might be serious. What does that mean for us? It can't be a good thing. And then thirdly, we realize they're kind of half serious, half of it gets done, half of it doesn't get done, and we kind of revert back to kind of a normal cycle. But you see a whole cottage industry of analysts and think tankers like to accompany that with the latest gossip about that. I think the reality is that the basic principle is there, but we all, the United States will always look, to, of course, to its interest when it comes to any EU 
initiative. And that's my last final point, back to my original point about how to make this strategic. You know, Europeans always ask Americans, don't you want a strong Europe? Uh, and you have the Europeans, well, what do you mean by a strong Europe? You mean the Europe of Margaret Thatcher or Charles de Gaulle? Uh, is it Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron? Europeans themselves don't, under, don't understand or agree on what this EU should be because the EU fundamentally is an evolving framework uh, in, w in which its member states are trying to sort out their interest and work together. It's not yet a unitary actor with the operational capacity to shape international events in real time. So the operational effectiveness of our relationship is to contingent, heavily contingent on the evolving nature of the EU. Our partnership should evolve as the EU evolves. So obstacles to that is, have less to do with American reluctance to engage or support than the limits of European capability, consensus, political will. And, and that's the reason the partnership punches below its weight. Our priorities are often mismatched. The United States usually is looking for efficiency and concrete results. And European institutions, if I may, usually seek legitimacy and symbolic US validation of the ongoing process of European integration. And that's why it's about process and, and terms and em emblems rather than uh, results. And if we're really honest with each other, EU member states, frankly, alternate between efforts to band together to resist US influence. And at the same time, they scramble competing with each other to secure US favor for their own particular national interests. The last place you see, a, a, a good uh, thing for Joe, in, is in Washington. The last place you see a United EU front is Washington because every bilateral embassy is scrambling to secure its own bilateral relationship with Washington. Uh, that's the EU we see in Washington. Uh, so I think much of it, frankly, is about the EU, the fact that it's evolving and uh, not really about the US blocking everything. So thank you. Great, thank you very much for that perspective. And I'm um, going to go to a European uh, in Washington now, namely Joe Dunn, who's the head of EPLO, the European Parliament Liaison Office, and is building closer links, not only with the Congress, but uh, hopefully the new administration. Over to you, Joe. Yes, thank you, Anthony, um, for the easy task of bringing the threads together of this, uh, I think, very sophisticated, high-level discussion, uh, finishing off with these very provocative remarks of Dan at the end, which I think could at least require at least another hour of discussion. But anyway, um, just a personal note, uh, I'll just um, put two sentences together to try and bring this discussion to an end. But uh, I just wanted to emphasize, or I think it's difficult to overstate uh, living here in Washington, the sense of relief, uh, you know, with the return to normal of, of the new administration and the contrast uh, between the professionalism that was described, um, you know, by, by the speakers and moving from 143 pardons and commutations to, you know, well-planned uh, rollout of executive orders um, signifying a return to normal, a return to professional uh, governance and professional uh, presidency. So, so it is a moment of opportunity, um, and as I think most of the discussion also pointed out, it's a moment of opportunity also for the EU-US. Um, this window has opened, and I think that you know, although it was criticized, or roundly criticized, I think the uh, um, High Representative's document on the EU-US agenda for global change uh, does capture the moment and uh, does have some uh, very good suggestions for how the EU-US agenda can be taken forward. Uh, but as, as Fran and, and Dan and others pointed out, this moment will, could be fleeting. We could be facing a very early uh, reality check as the kind of fundamental differences uh, informing our, our respective uh, worldviews uh, or legislation come, regulate, regulatory approaches come to the fore. Uh, but I would retain some very practical suggestions that emerged. Um, I think the Atlantic Recovery Initiative sounds uh, interesting. Uh, dialogue and data governance, uh, transatlantic Green Deal, and so on. And I very much agree with what Fran was saying about uh, disinformation as a threat to democracy and how important the planned summit on democracies is for, for everyone in the EU and especially also for the European Parliament. Um, and I would 
and of course it's natural for me in my position to emphasize it, but I think the parliamentary dialogue is an underdeveloped muscle of this relationship. Uh, EU-US traditionally relies very heavily on, on executive, executive to executive dialogue. So I think the uh, burgeoning parliamentary dialogue uh, is a very important part of the way forward. So I think the what I retain from this very, very interesting discussion is that uh, we can be hopeful um, of developments looking ahead, uh, but we need to be pragmatic and um, we need to focus uh, on result, concrete results. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. It was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And thank you so much, Anthony, for inviting me um, to give the final, final remark. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure. Thank you to um, Fran and to Bruce, who's still with us. Thanks to Dan and Lane, who've had to already to leave. It's been a really a great discussion, covered a huge amount of ground, very thought-provoking, very timely. And um, we try through these EPRS policy roundtables to open up uh, pathways for discussion on current uh, public policy issues. And that's why next Tuesday we will have our next roundtable at uh, 1330 hours Brussels time, which is on the economic and budgetary outlook for 2021 both generically and also on the basis of a publication which EPRS produces every year on that exact subject. So look forward to seeing uh, as many of you as possible on that occasion. Uh, we're just now literally for the first time dipped below 100 participants. So this has been a very popular event and it's been terrific to have this discussion. And I'd like to thank everybody involved, both those who spoke and indeed those who organized it. And um, just falls to me really to say goodbye and have a very nice rest of the morning in Washington and afternoon and evening in Brussels. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.